Welcome, everybody. We're so glad to be in person. Um, so uh, we're really thrilled to have everybody be joining us today for this fall's policy breakfast, Supply Skepticism Revisited. Um, we have some seats up here. Don't be shy. This is a great room of people um, who are really uh, open to letting you sit next to them. <laughs> Uh, my name is Matt Murphy. I'm the executive director of the NYU Furman Center. On behalf of the Furman Center and our faculty directors, Vicki Bean, Ingrid Ellen, and Kathy O'Regan, I really sincere, sincerely welcome you this morning. Um, before going through the presentation, I just want to thank a few folks who are just so critical to making something like this happen. Um, our student researchers are a huge part of everything we do. They range from undergrads to graduate students, PhD students, um, to all of you, thank you. In particular, I really want to thank Camille Priel Damas, Shira Kogan, Sarah Internicola. They just put a lot of hard work into this research um, and are just phenomenal uh, students for us. I also want to thank Kayla Merriweather, Donna Borak, Bethany O'Neill, Haley Rates, and Jachi Dong. They're just a few members of our really amazing full time team that worked really hard to make this event happen as well. Um, but a huge thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, I know we're still figuring out com coming back to these events, but we are just so encouraged by your presence and just wanting to be part of this conversation. Um, today's discussion focuses on a topic of increasing importance, but also deepening passions. So we acknowledge there's various perspectives, not just in this room, but just in every chamber of government across the nation, every community really across the nation. Well, we take pride in the part of our mission that says we promote frank and productive discussions about critical issues in urban policy. So we're really focused on drawing that out today. We have a great panel um, and can't wait to um, hear from them. So with that, I would like you to turn off your cell phones. I haven't said that in a long time. Um, I don't actually know if I've ever said that. Uh, mute them. <laughs> um, Please don't interrupt the panelists. We will have 10 minutes at the end of the panel for to take audience questions. There's going to be people walking up and down the aisle. You have some note cards on, on the um, uh, chairs as well. And there, there will be pens available to write your question. Just flag them down to add your question to the list. Um, we are releasing a working paper today called Supply Skepticism Revisited. Um, it's a, in the QR code in your program builds on a 2019 work written by our faculty directors that had examined the latest causal research and explores the relationship between new housing supply and housing costs. So with that, I just want to do a quick presentation to remind us where we are and some of the highlights of that work. So a lot of you are familiar with this chart. It's kind of Canon Furman Center um, data. But this just reminds us the disconnect in how median renter household income has changed relative to how median rent has changed in New York City since 2007. The takeaway, over the last 15 years, rent costs have risen faster than renter household incomes. One consequence of this dynamic is that 32% of all renter households paid more than 50% of their income in rent in 2021. A contributing factor to this disconnect is that new housing supply does not respond quickly to increases in demand, thereby putting pressure on the housing stock that already exists, driving up prices for available housing. Indeed, even in high demand New York City, the permitting rate from 2014 to 2021 lagged that of many of our neighboring jurisdictions, especially in New Jersey. So with that local context in mind, let's talk a little bit about supply skepticism. First off, the notion of supply skepticism doesn't just exist. It's actually quite prevalent. Um, a recent paper to, done, written in 2022 by researchers at UC Santa Barbara, UC Davis School of Law, and Tulane University described that in representative national surveys, only 30 to 40 percent of respondents believe that increasing housing supply would lower prices and rents. Another 30 and four, to 40 percent believe that additional supply would actually have the opposite effect. Importantly, these findings were unique to housing. Respondents generally believed that supply shocks in other kinds of markets would reduce prices. In the paper, our faculty directors sought to systematically and sympathetically review the latest causal literature covering the concerns of supply skeptics, who argue that new housing supply does not slow rent growth or growth in housing costs. 
specific, specifically, supply skeptics argue that new supply does not, in, does not decrease rents or slow rent growth, even at a regional level, because the effect is offset by induced demand. Another argument is that new supply will actually make matters worse in the immediately surrounding area because it would increase neighborhood amenities, causing gentrification and driving up demand. And in so doing, by increasing rents, would actually displace low-income residents. A third concern of supply skeptics is that market rate housing won't have any effect on the lower cost segments of the, of the market, so any positive benefits wouldn't actually help low-income residents. Another is that reductions in regulatory restrictions won't increase supply enough to have an actual impact on rents. And then somewhat of an emerging argument is that the real problem is the inefficient use of existing housing and that policymakers should instead focus on regulating second homes or short-term rentals rather than building new housing. So today we'll review the latest research that responds to these con specific concerns. So supply skeptics worry that at a regional level, even if additional supply moderates rents, it will induce more demand and thereby offset any advantage of new supply. However, new evidence does find decreases in citywide rents when supply is added. The 2023 paper reviewed the case of Auckland, New Zealand, where floor area ratios were increased for what equated to three quarters of Auckland's land, so a huge amount of the, the city. The researchers found that it led to a 4% increase in the city's housing stock and that over time rents there were lower when compared to a control group of other New, New Zealand cities with similar characteristics. But this upzoning was unusually large. Recent research in Germany actually found that a smaller increase in annual new supply caused just 1% uh, or of, of just 1% of the stock caused the average rent level to in local municipalities to fall by 0.2%. So skeptics also argue that new supply will do little to affect rent prices at a local level. Theoretically, the impact of new construction on neighborhood rents depend upon the relative magnitude of two opposing forces, which much of the research focuses on drawing out. One is the supply effect, where competitive pressure pulls rents down, and the amenity effect, that added amenities increase demand and push rents up. Researchers face a challenge in studying the localized impact of new supply because they must disentangle whether developers are adding supply because they believe demand is already there or increasing in a given place, or whether the new, new supply itself is actually increasing demand. So to avoid just measuring correlations, their methodological solution is to compare treated areas with random additions to the housing stock to untreated areas. So what does the research show? In our review of the research, we find that most of the new evidence points to moderate decreases in rents or the rent growth rate. Three studies of different American cities, including New York City, found that new housing supply had the effect of de decreasing rents in nearby buildings. However, two papers that are currently under revision um, had found more mixed results. One found that new units had no significant effect on rents overall, but that when you seg Mented out neighborhoods by the pre-development rent, new units increased rent by 6.6% in lower cost neighborhoods and decreased rent by about 3% in more expensive neighborhoods. Another found an increase in rents in the time between permitting and completion, but also found that rents level off after buildings were actually completed. Here, it's important to note that this study looked at a unique time period in the uni uh, housing market, the period right prior to and during the Great Recession. The essential question for policymakers is whether new housing supply leads to gentrification. While the term gentrification means different things to different people, researchers typically measure it as an increase in the number of share of wealthier, more educated households in a neighborhood. New studies find some evidence that new housing supply causes rather than follows gentrification. For example, Kate Pennington finds a two and a half percentage point increase in the probability of gentrification of nearby parcels of new market rate buildings. However, residents of the new buildings are not exclusively higher income residents. Two separate papers find that 20% and 50% respectively of residents in the new buildings moved from below median income areas. And new residents of the neighborhoods in which new buildings are being built are also not exclusively higher income households. 
Brian Asquith and Karen Chapel both find increased in migration by lower income households in areas surrounding new buildings. Whether new supply causes displacement is one of the most important questions facing urban policy researchers today. Without good local data on the motivation for tenant moves, whether they are voluntary or involuntary, this is just one of the hardest questions to answer empirically. The most recent applicable literature is mixed and finds that new construction either mitigates displacement or modestly elevates it. Pennington finds that the risk of displacement falls by about 17% for households living within 100 meters of an additional new housing development. Karen Chapel, however, finds that new construction is correlated with slightly higher outmigration with the lowest income groups when relying on one data set. On another data set, the findings don't hold. So it points to the importance of uh, needing to have better data really for all of us. Other recent studies have also looked at the impact of new market rate housing on of housing available to lower income residents. Broadly, they find that additions to the housing stock at the higher end of the market can decrease prices and rents in lower cost submarkets. There are few pathways for this effect. Theoretically, in the short run, new supply sparks a move from one apartment to another, which then creates a chain of moves, opening up housing availability that isn't limited to just that new building. But also in the long run, research shows that older units will filter down to lower price submarkets. But filtering takes a long time, and areas with high home price growth, like New York City, may see lower rates of downward filtering and higher rates of owners actually upgrading units, further reducing supply by um, filtering housing up. So with that in mind, there's new research on chains of moves triggered by new supply. For example, Evan Mast traced the prior residence of 52,000 prior uh, occupants of large new market rate multifamily buildings in above median income tracks, 12 central cities, found that 67% of movers into the new unit are from the same metro area, um, usually high income areas nearby, and 20% of the incomers um, were from below median tracks in the same metro. But by the sixth round of the moving chain, so measuring somebody moving out and somebody moving in and thereby, you know, keep going and going to the sixth time, 40% of those moving into an apartment vacated through the chain were from below median income tracks within the, in the metro area. Ratu also found that over two years, for every 100 new centrally located market rate units, about 66 units became available in the bottom half of the neighborhood income distribution. And in Germany, Mens found that through these moving chains, new units reduced rents even in the lower rent markets, probably because each new unit resulted in about five moves within the following 12 months. Finally, there's some debate over whether land use and zoning reforms actually result in new housing supply. Recent research does find that easing restrictions eases or increases the supply of housing. But there are caveats, including whether that constraint the, that is relaxed is the specific regulation that was actually preventing the new housing in the first place, and whether new regulations impose new costs on development. So, in sum, the new evidence shows that increases in housing supply, slow growth of rents in the region. In some circumstances, new construction also reduces rents or rent growth in the surrounding area. While new supply is associated with gentrification, it has not been shown to cause large-scale displacement of lower-income households. The chains of moves sparked by new construction free up apartments that are rented or retained by households across the income spectrum. And easing land use restrictions, at least on a broad scale, and in ways that change binding constraints on development generally leads to more new housing over time, but only uses a fraction of the new capacity that's created because of other factors outside of land use. In all, recent research provides evidence that new supply can help reduce pressures on rents, both citywide and at a neighborhood level. However, it's important to note that market rate supply is unlikely to ever meet the housing needs of the lowest income households will need to be paired with subsidies to ensure all households have access to quality affordable housing. From a policy perspective, communities should use carrots and sticks to ensure that new supply achieves a balance of incomes in all neighborhoods. So the conversation about housing supply impact plays out in many recent high profile debates in New York City and New York State, including property tax reform and the role of 421A, Governor Hochul's housing compact, mandatory inclusionary housing, 
and individual neighborhood or site rezonings. We read about these all the time. But an upcoming debate that will play out over the next year is Mayor Adams' City of Yes for Housing Opportunity Proposal, which aims to add more housing in every neighborhood. I'm sure this crowd is very familiar with the proposal, so take a look at the proposed, um, or uh, examples of the proposed changes here. And I'm now going to uh, move us onto our panel and um, invite everybody up to the stage. Um, and please join me in welcoming them. Uh, Vicki Bean will be the moderator of today's panel. Vicki is the Judge Edward Weinfeld Professor of Law at NYU School of Law and the faculty director here at the NYU Furman Center, along with being the uh, Deputy Mayor of Housing and Economic Development in New York City prior to this role. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Lisa Gomez, Blondell Pinnock, Brooklyn Borough President Antonio Reynoso, and Michelle De La Uz. Your bios are in the program. Great, so it's, it's so nice to see everybody here, to be in person, to have a, a very full room. Um, and to have a lot of excitement over over this um, topic. So thank you all for being here. And thank you to our incredible panelists who have really seen this issue from a, um, a huge variety of, uh, of uh, vantage points. So we're really excited to, uh, to get their take on um, how this new evidence can, um, uh, can play out here in New York. So, so let me just start by asking, so uh, all of you, really, we've, we've heard uh, the arguments like those identified here as supply skeptics arguments um, from a wide variety of sources in, in the debates in New York. Will these new findings make a difference in that debate? And if so, which ones and why? Um, will this really um, help shift the debate? And then we'll, we'll talk um, about what else might be needed to shift the debate. But President, let me start with you. It's nice to be here, and it's nice to see you. It's a long time. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm, uh, the only part that uh, it, I've been drawn away from Brooklyn, so um, <laughs> not how it. Sometimes. You yeah, I know. I know. You got to live Florida, right? I know. At least it's Lower Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. It, you're right. You're right. Um, but it's nice. To, it's nice to be here. Uh, this this can help. Um, I think there's been a, a change. Over the last eight to uh, five to eight years, uh, in the political sphere, mainly because of the increase in the homeless shelters and the homeless population, to really do something about just housing supply in general, we need more apartments to put people in. I think the the, the fight here is affordable housing versus market rate housing, um, also the amount of housing uh, that is available in the city of New York. It's just uh, thirty thousand units built in Long Island City, twelve thousand five hundred units built in East New York. And it doesn't seem like it's making a dent on, on the rents being lowered in the city of New York. And I think that comes down to the fact that it's a small group of neighborhoods doing all the work versus it being a, a, a everyone, all hands on deck, which I think will actually make a difference. So it's just, um, I'm not sure. Uh, and then also the polarization of these communities. These black and brown communities have done all the work, so they're very skeptical about anything, especially something coming from, let's say, NYU, um, that is going to say that they're wrong. So I just want to, you know, it's just like, of course they would say that, that that's what we need to do um, because they've experienced gentrification. They've seen it um, in a way that Bay Ridge, uh, you know, she said, she said Bay, uh, Midwood, and Canarsie have never seen that, that type of increase in Brooklyn. So um, I think it's, it's up to debate, which is why we're here, I guess. Yes, right. yes, why we're here. Mm -hmm. Lisa? So Blondell and I were kind of whispering to each other when Matt was making the presentation and thinking about the comparability of some of the, um, the cities that you, you looked at or the literature looked at. Mm -hmm. And I think what's so unique for New York as a big city is that we are such a city of renters. So any change one way or the other in renters, in, in rents, renters or availability affects so many more people exponentially. You know, I think there's there's the political, there's the logical, and I think we, you know, our job is to thread thread that middle to get more supply built. I will say that you know it's something you hear very often: affordable for whom, not affordable for our neighborhood. It's a very very common refrain, and the the, the fact is that a regular old apartment in 
New York, affordable apartment, costs about $750 a month to operate without a mortgage, without taxes, without evil developer profit. That is just the operating cost of a unit. About half of that is composed of insurance, which is crazy town right now, um, and staffing for the supers, the porters, et cetera. So when people say affordable for whom, and they see rents of $1,000 and they think folks are getting rich, they're probably not even covering mortgages on that. So, you know, I think there has to be sort of a reset. Uh, not only have has supply not kept up, but I don't know that incomes have kept up. And when you have such a city of renters, um, supply is going to be constrained. I do think I agree with the borough president that we need all hands on deck producing all housing. We would produce as much affordable housing as we can finance. The fact of the matter is the resources aren't there um, at the city, state, or federal level. And New York does so much more than any other city or state in the country, bar none. But the, the supply is, is uh, the, the, the need is endless and the supply is limited. Bondell? Uh, good morning. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, you know, I probably am the proxy or poster child for um, gentrification and displacement, um, being that I'm uh, heading up an organization in Bed-Stuy um, that is literally going through, probably, um, or has gone through gentrification um, in the worst way. And I think that, um, and Antonio touched on this, I mean, I think that the fact that um, the data is grounded in, um, in the fact that providing and building more housing will in fact lower rents. However, mm -hmm. um, that does not bear out with skepticism. Um, and what we know is that we have communities, particularly communities like Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights, um, that have been disappointed mm -hmm. um, over the past with promises that have been made by government. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a, there's the, the skepticism that exists um, has been well earned <laughs> in many instances. Um, and and it's going to take um, it's going to take government, it's going to take community organizations, uh, it's going to take all of us to be able to get community buy-in um, to let people understand um, how this dynamic works. Um, but at the end of the day, I do believe for me and the work that we're doing, it is an income gap issue. Um, so it's not just it's, it's, it is it is supply, it is housing. But if people cannot afford it, at the end of the day. That's the problem that we're having, and people are feeling that pressure. Mm -hmm. Michelle, um, thanks so much for including uh, me. And I'll just say, you know, so Fifth Avenue Committee, um, you know, we're based in Brooklyn. We we build affordable housing um, in Brooklyn and in, and in Queens. And um, you know, our work really kind of spans multiple neighborhoods. Some highly gentrified, like Park Slope, um, and. Uh, Gowanus and other communities which are, you know, rank highly on the risk of gentrification scale like, like Sunset Park. Um, but we also do a lot of tenant organizing and eviction prevention work in Bay Ridge um, and are trying to cite a project there. So, you know, kind of see the perspectives um, from all angles. So, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a solid maybe in terms of whether or not it's going to help. Um, I think that the research alone is not enough, honestly. I think that it's, um, it absolutely has to be like hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, if you will, uh, neighborhood-level conversations um, with trusted people in the community um, who kind of really understand the dynamics of what people are facing. Um, and then, you know, there has to be uh, clear benefits um, for, for local residents in the community. Um, and, you know, I would say, of course, in particular, lower income residents of color, because um, the skepticism really is on all sides. Um, it's from folks who um, are wealthy and um, just don't want change. And then skepticism from lower income folks of color who really fear uh, displacement. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. So let's I want to follow up on on something that that Bondell really raised, and that is, I mean, we are seen movement. Um, there are people in the audience, for example, from Open New York, and we've seen much more discussion about some of the advantages of increasing supply. But there is this question about expectations and how do we mm -hmm. manage expectations? How do we, mm -hmm. you know, make clear? And, and this goes back to something that you were saying, Borough mm -hmm. President, is, you know, we've seen <laughs> supply in places like Long Island City, and yet 
rents haven't dropped. Now, if you look at the amount of supply, as that one of the very first um, uh, slides that Matt showed, right, we, we have seen more supply, but it's a, it's a small amount compared to the increase in, uh, in population increase to what we used to build. It doesn't make up for the gap that we saw in, in really the 80s and 90s where we weren't building anything even though we were uh, growing and, and retaining people. So, you know, how do we drill down and persuasively present the, you know, evidence so that we can manage expectations and not get in a situation where, you know, people feel like they've been promised, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, gold at the end of the rainbow and it didn't come. What, what can we do to, to, to really talk to people about what's really needed and how long it's going to take to meet that demand? Yeah. So I, I would, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble today. <laughs> <laughs> we love why, that. Why stop now? <laughs> we love that. Um, uh, political will, right, and, and boldness is not something that exists in the city of New York. So I just want to be very clear. <laughs> um, we're just not bold enough. And we're, we're, and it's a problem. Mm -hmm. I, I put together a comprehensive plan for Brooklyn mm -hmm. because we don't want, the, the expectations are in the comprehensive plan. This is what your community will look like in the next 20 years. We will build four new schools because that is going to be what's needed in the increase in population. We're going to build you more parks or fix the parks that you have because the increase of, of folks in your neighborhood are going to need parks. Uh, we're going to add more bike lanes because the folks that are moving in are not drivers necessarily. Um, the DEP will make sure that your sewer lines are, have the capacity to take on the increase in population. Um, we're going to do all that regardless of whether or not uh, we're building housing supply because the city just needs it to survive for the next 200 years. That's just it. So you know you're going to get that no matter what. Housing should be the same way. Because we're one of two things. We have a responsibility to the greater good. And it doesn't seem like it. It seems like housing is not something that is a human right. We have people on the left that would march down the streets talking about housing as a human right because they don't want people displaced. Would be the first people to march against the development that's going up in a neighborhood. Right? And it's because of that. Is we, we have to take the politics out of housing supply. We have to have a conversation in which the city assumes the responsibility in, with political will in building housing supply for a growing city. And it is now a crisis, and by any all means, uh, uh, an executive order by the mayor could be put forth that we have a crisis in homelessness, and the way to address that is to build housing and can take charge and do more when it comes to housing supply. And start fighting against the NIMBYs in neighborhoods that are mostly white and affluent. And that is like, that's, the, that's it. That's how you solve for this. Be aggressive and be bold. But this city is not bold. It is not. It does not think outside the box. The, uh, the, uh, yes, uh, city of yes. <laughs> the city of yes it is, is a good thing. So I want to start there. All right, Ben, you hear me? It's a good thing. <laughs> but it's nonsense. That is nothing. That is a, a chapter in a book that needs to be rewritten. The city of Yes allowing for auxiliary space to be done from a garage to convert into apartments so your grandchild can sit there, so your mother-in-law, that's nonsense. That's <laughs> nothing. City should be considering no single family zoning in the city of New York. That we should now start talking about R3 being the lowest that we were ever gonna be able to build here. And just doing something like that, so it's equitable. Doesn't matter where you're from, whether you're in Bed-Stuy, whether you're in, in uh, Riverdale, it doesn't matter. You get, to, you get a choice. Keep your house to one story for one family or build it to three stories and provide for your children and build more equity. We don't care. That's bold. Mm -hmm. And Ben Max is going to write something about that and I'm going to get in trouble for it. <laughs> but I think that the point is, and I don't mind getting in trouble. I've expended so much political capital on this, on this type of stuff that I just don't care. And it seems to be, I'd be I'm being rewarded for it. So I'm okay for it. But I just want you to know that the city of Yes should not be something that we're applauding as a, like a, a, a generational changing thing. It is basic, nonsensical like re zoning work or text uh, amendment work that we're fixing. We're just fixing a problem. We're not, we're not doing anything bold. So I would just say that I think the problem we have is there's no political will to do this stuff in an expansive way. 
um, and that we celebrate things like the city of yes, like they're they're bigger than what they are. Um, so, that's good. Lisa, um, wow, it's hard to follow the vice president. Um, <laughs> so I would say one thing that I've noticed that's changed. I've been doing this work a long time, um, and it's sort of the turnover on the politics, which I think feeds into the fear of being bold. If you look at what happened in the Marjorie Velasquez race, uh, you know, a bunch of us who do this work are like, okay, every ULERP just became three times as hard because with term limits, you don't have the ability to sort of build that long-term relationship and maybe say to your elected official, okay, that's bold, I'm gonna go with you and give it time to see if it works. You have eight years, you're in, you're out, and you're running to the next thing, and I think that that's what the city has voted for. That's what we have. Um, but I think it really works against long-term planning for long-term results and, and does not favor boldness. Blondell, you, you, raised, you sparked this. So what, what can we do to uh, be bold, be realistic, not you know, set expectations that are going to fall flat? What, what could we do to, to um, move the debate forward in that way? I mean, I think what's important is uh, we have to have community buy-in. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've seen recently in um, Hallett's Point with Tiffany Caban, they, you, they were able to approve 1,300 new units there. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles Barron um, got approval for what, 2,000 units uh, over across 11 buildings. But what they had was community buy-in. And, and a GPP. And, and a GPP. <laughs> yeah. Let's not forget that. Just saying. Um, um, but they did have community buying, and they were able to extract um, some concessions with, within those projects. So I do think it's important that you have to, you're going to have to engage community in a way to bring them to the table so that they feel that they're getting something out of this. Because without that... Um, it's going to be very, very difficult to move this discussion forward because, again, we're talking about just the level of distrust that exists in many of these communities. Um, so having the community engage, engaged in the beginning of this discussion and, and look, everyone's not going to get everything at the end of the day, and we know that. Um, but I do think that there has to be, to, to your point, so that that long-term um, um, economic community building that's going to have to happen, and it's hard when you're term limited, right? Because yeah. you're looking, you're looking, uh, you're projecting over time. Um, but I do think that you, you're going to have to start with community engagement um, and bringing the community to the table to talk it out and fight it out in most mm -hmm. instances. So, Michelle, you know a thing or two about community engagement, um, mm -hmm. and. Um, and by the way, we should say congratulations to Michelle for the Sunset Park Library yeah. project, yeah. Um, which, uh, was yesterday. which involved a lot of community engagement. Um, so, you know, so what do you think would be, what are all the elements that we need to have in place to bring the community along? What, what do they need to see? Um, I mean, a, a couple examples. So, you, you know, you mentioned the, the Sunset Park uh, apartments and library projects. So that's 100% affordable housing over a new and expanded public library. And there were still people against it. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, yesterday over 200 people and like, you know, people were just beaming, just seeing the, the library space and, and seeing the apartments and, um, you know, meeting the actual tenants in the building, many of whom were for Sunset Park. Yep. Um, uh, you know, in terms of what what are the key elements to, to bring it all together, um, you know, I'll just say, you know, in Gowanus, um, you know, with, with, of course, your leadership as, as deputy mayor, um, you know, 8,500 new units of housing, 3,000 of which um, will be deeply and permanently affordable, including 2,000 mandatory inclusionary housing units, about 1,000 units um, that back in our Gowanus Green Partners will build on a city-owned site and then another small 100% affordable housing project. Um, seven years of organizing, seven years, okay? Um, with a lot of philanthropy, quite honestly, supporting that organizing over that period of time. Weekly calls mm. with um, multi-racial, multi-sector <laughs> stakeholders, okay? Um, who at different points in time absolutely wanted to walk away because they didn't think that the rezoning um, was going to benefit them, in particular public housing residents. Um, they are, formed a coalition, the Gowanus Neighborhood Coalition for Justice. Um, 
the number one demand of that coalition was that um, the city invest um, in the preservation of uh, public housing at Gowanus and Wyckoff houses. Um, and I am, you know, very thankful to say that again, with your with your leadership as as deputy mayor, over two hundred million dollars has been committed um, to do comprehensive uh, modernization in unit modernization of of those uh, units. Um, at, but I, I have to say, like a lot of it is about trust. Like I know you, I trust you, right? We've had a relationship for many years. Um, Council Member Brad Lander was a planner. <laughs> He was the former executive director of the Fifth Avenue Committee. Um, you know, he knew how to have very in-depth conversations with the Department of City Planning and with City Hall about all of the requirements. There was like, you know, no light, I say, between the coalition and the position of our council members. Steve Levin also represented a portion of the rezoned area. Like, we had regular meetings with them about, um, uh, you know, we ended up with 56 points of agreement um, with the city. Um, we have the first ever um, community controlled oversight task force. Um, public meeting is December 14th if you'd like to come. <laughs> PS 133. Um, so it, it takes all of those things, but it, it takes trust. It takes people seeing that there's something in it for them. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a lot of attention to detail. Uh, yeah, that's, that, you know, and, and all of that you know, and I think it also takes um, someone who can counter the narrative. Like, so the narrative that happens these days around rezonings um, is, you know, that that rezonings equal gentrification and equal displacement. And that's, you know, because most of the rezonings until Gowanus had happened in communities of color, um, you know, quite honestly, the, the white upper income homeowners tried to use that narrative in Gowanus. And I was like, ah, mm -hmm. Gowanus is no longer a community of color. There's been a lot of displacement. The, you know, the folks of color that are here now are either in NYCHA or in Fifth Avenue Committee owned affordable housing. They're not at risk of displacement. Right. Um, you know, we did the first ever um, racial equity study of what the, the impact of the rezoning would be before the, um, cause our rezoning was certified, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, before the law was passed, so it didn't need to happen. Now all rezoning, all city-sponsored rezonings need to include that. So, um, you know, the, the, the analysis that we did with Professor Lance Freeman and with City uh, Council Land Use staff showed that 3,000 units, 35% of the overall total in Gowanus would actually reverse the trends of uh, racial exclusion that had been going on um, in the community. Mm -hmm. So, like, you got to do all of the, the conversation, but you also have to have the research to back it up. It, and it, it, like I said, I mean, hand-to-hand -hand combat sounds horrible, especially the, today's day and age. Um, but it, it, it takes that level of like one-on-one -on -one conversation, like multiple points of engagement. Or to the borough president's point, like you go big and bold, and then you can just like have the conversation at a much higher level, um, which, you know, I think it all be very, very effective and quite efficient. Yeah. <laughs> That's seven years of groundwork. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, even more, honestly. Right, yeah. right, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, I do want to emphasize that. I mean, the, the time that that takes the against the term limit problem, right? right? Um, right. And against, and, and I want to come back to, to you, Borough President, on this, but also against the fact that the city can't do all this on its own. It can't do ADUs. It can't do right. in single-family zoning. Mm -hmm. right. It can't do a lot of things without the state approval, and we don't have mm -hmm. bold thinking in mm -hmm. the suburbs of New York City on those kinds of, of mm -hmm. issues, and many, not all. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's a lot that goes on there, and also, as your remarks, people's remarks have pointed out, we, we have a property, we have a tax problem, mm -hmm. a tax incentive problem. We have all kinds of things. So, so tell us your thinking, Borough President, about the comprehensive plan and how that's going to move things forward yeah. um, and how it's going to address some of these kinds of issues. Yeah, so obviously the city of New York doesn't have a comprehensive plan. I think uh, Bloomberg had Plan NYC and it was the closest thing too. Uh, and I would argue, while not being a big fan of the Bloomberg era uh, when I was a, a staffer, um, that Bloomberg would arguably be the best manager of the mayors we've had over the last, you know, de Blasio and Eric Adams, a manager, the best manager. And he understood very principally that we needed to be talking about 10 and 20 years. We need to talk about this in a longer term way 
because the city is not sustainable to manage a city on like every day you wake up, it's a new thing. Um, and it seems like that's how other folks are managing it. So I decided it was long before that, but I always thought a comprehensive plan was just very practical. Um, I tried to do it several times by passing legislation to the city council. They just didn't go anywhere. I tried to get the Charter Revision Commission to force the city to do it, and I was uh, everyone said no. Uh, DCP, the Department of City Planning, which I thought would be the most enthusiastic about a comprehensive plan, said they didn't want to do it. Um, and I always say the Department of City Planning is more the Department of City Zoning than it is the Department of City Planning. Um, I, I don't necessarily think it's a productive place to be if you are a planner and you're a dreamer. Um, <laughs> but, but I would say that the comprehensive plan was to do just that. It's just like start showing people what it is they're going to get long before they have it. I now can move forward with ULERP applications in my office in like three days because everybody knows what they're getting before they even come in. The developer will come and say, hey, we want to build you know, a 12-story building on this right next to this train station with no parking uh, that um, want to contribute to a fund for a school because of the increase. They know everything I'm going to be asking for. And then they're sending their applications in, responding and saying, these principles within your comprehensive plan are being addressed by my rezoning. This is like, that's very practical and thoughtful and, 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 and forward, forward thinking. The community board knows what I'm going to say before I've said it. The community, every single community in Brooklyn knows what I'm going to do and say. It's already done. And no one, I, I, no pitchforks, no, no, no madness. <laughs> it, everyone's like, oh, and so he's kind of saying what he says. That's where he lives. And we're going to work or, or through that. The problem is, is I'm a borough president. I'm not the mayor of the city of New York and I'm not a city council member. So my control on this is very limited. So what I'm trying to do is two things. I'm inspire and show people, hey, you can do this. You can be this person and get elected borough president not using identity politics, right? Like on policy, people are going to like you for being thoughtful and sincere about what needs to happen. And so that's the first one. And two is just showing better management principles. Like this city, we don't manage well. Um, and I will say that the city doesn't manage well. And there's a perception that black and brown elected officials don't do management. And we went on identity politics and that we play this role in which people get elected because uh, we're saying things that are, are feeding, uh, you know, culture work versus like being practical, being thoughtful, being planners, which is what I think I am. So I wanted to showcase that as well. So that's the goal of the comprehensive plan. And I still want the city to take it on. I'm trying to inspire the other borough presidents to be a part of it. I'm trying to get Dan Gorodnik to say, hey, we can start like this principally. We can start this work. I did it with three staff members and about $250,000. Imagine if we had the entire Department of City Planning team there and their, their, their expertise and their, and their motivation to be able to do this. Um, and I, that's, why, that's why I did it. So that's uh, the thought of it. And also being very... I, I made mention to landmarks being a big problem in the city of New York um, and landmark districts specifically that are specifically done to keep affluent communities affluent and white. Um, that was done back then. Maybe they're nicer people now, but back then that's what it was for. Um, so we're looking at that single family zoning, talking about the problem with that and specifically talking about in Brooklyn, South of Empire Avenue and places like Bay Ridge, built 80 units of housing in the entire in the entire like since 1964, and I'm going to end right here. I know I'm talking a lot. Bay Ridge is building seven new schools in three years, seven new schools with only 80 units of new housing. How is that possible? Because we don't plan and we don't think. Bay Ridge has the highest population growth of single, uh, two and three families living in single family homes. So they're in the same house now three generations in, and the, the city doesn't plan, so it doesn't see that. It just sees that there's no housing growth. And now we have 50 kids in a classroom. It's like, how is this happening? Just no planning. So what do we do? We react. And now we're building schools in impractical areas, in impractical ways. And we're having to negotiate and leverage the building of schools to developers that should be doing something else, not giving us new schools, right? Figuring out other things that other amenities or, or, or give back to the community that will be more meaningful. We can't do that because we have to force a school into these new buildings because we need seven of them because we didn't plan. So that's an example, the Bay Ridge example, is an, as something that I want to prevent from happening um, in the future. So it's just being thoughtful and just trying to think long term. So, so a couple of aspects of that. I mean, one is the, the fairness aspects, right? When you ha your plan lays out, every community's got to step forward. Here's some that have already stepped forward and, 
and perhaps um, uh, you know and, and have stepped forward and here are those that haven't yeah. and that notion of fairness which also was was uh, represented yesterday in yesterday's passage of uh, speaker Adams's uh, uh, fair housing uh, mm -hmm. framework, yeah. right? That can help, right, in making yeah, making people feel like, okay, everybody's stepping up. I'm not being asked to do something. Of course, that's limited by the fact that we can only go to 12 FAR in yeah. built-out yeah. communities already, mm -hmm. and that's a real limit on the, that fairness um, uh, yeah. construct. Yeah. The second thing, besides the sort of sense of fairness that comes from uh, the kind of planning that you did, is also the the interaction between housing and all of the infrastructure, you know, that you're getting all the things that you need to make a community work at the same time or, or together. Um, a, a disadvantage might be they come to you knowing what you want. Does that address the kinds of concerns that Blondell raised about sufficient community engagement, the, communi the individual community, not the borough, but the individual community being yeah. able to say we need this, we need additional, uh, you know, donations or whatever exactions type of thing into the yeah. process. So, so Blanda, what's what's your reaction to that? It, is there enough community engagement in in the kind of comprehensive plan that the borough president has put forward? Um, you know, I'm I'm being new to Brooklyn and being new to this mm -hmm. role. I, mean, I, ha I have read your comprehensive plan, mm -hmm. and um, I know that the borough president is a planner. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and, and it seems to me, just based on history mm -hmm. um, and based on the, the seat I'm sitting in now, that when it comes particularly to Brooklyn, that there is um, a level of engagement that's required um, in order to move forward with planning and to think about the future. Um, when I look at the history of restoration, the, the reason why restoration was even started or founded uh, was based on community activism and engagement. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, Robert Kennedy touring different areas in the city and determining that they would create this experiment of public-private partnership mm -hmm. um, and creating the first CDC in Bed-Stuy um, because of the community mm -hmm. activism that was there, that was present at that time. So mm -hmm. I suspect that in, in, in this, this um, plan that you made, the compact, that you had to, yeah. you had to engage the community. Yeah. Um, when restoration is um, right now in the consideration of our, our um, innovation campus and the reimagining of restoration, we had to engage the community um, envisioning sessions um, prior to the start and the design mm -hmm. uh, because they were very vocal about what they wanted to see. So I, I what I understand is that if, if you're engaging, if you're doing any type of forward looking or planning, whether it's in housing, um, community development, commercial development, that there is a level of engagement that has to take place um, in order to move to move the to move the change or move the, the, yeah. the conversation forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an issue with the city of Yes is a text amendment. It's it's citywide, et cetera, as opposed to the kinds of individual rezonings that. The Gowan that Gowanus represents and yeah. and Blondell, you, you needed a, a rezoning, right, on the yes. plaza? Yeah, yes, you needed an individual through. rezoning mm -hmm. on the plaza. So, and those individual rezonings provide more of an opportunity to say what we really need in this neighborhood, not the borough, but in right. this neighborhood is X, Y, Z. So, how are you all thinking about that trade-off of individual rezonings that really allow that deep dive into what the neighborhood needs to move forward? versus this more citywide approach or borough-wide approach. Mm -hmm. Michelle, you want to jump in on that? Um, I mean, I think the thing to think about is um, the same values need to inform things, whether it's an individual application, a private application, um, you know, or a city-sponsored neighborhood rezoning or a comprehensive plan. You know, issues around fairness, issues around equity, issues around inclusion. I think those values need to be front and center in every conversation. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they might look and feel a bit different in different neighborhoods, but mm -hmm. I, I think you have to kind of appeal to people, you know, people's um, greater good um, in these conversations so that it doesn't just devolve into, you know, what is it, what, what's in it for me. Like, you have to balance the individual with the collective in these conversations. Mm -hmm. Lisa, you've, you've built 
all around the city <coughs> and you've built outside of the city. So what's what's your perspective? I think that, you know, building on everything everybody else is saying, um, if you did have a comprehensive plan that was more, I'll call it as of right, that everything wasn't hand-to-hand -hand combat and you mm -hmm. weren't engaging in every con con conversation about what's in it for me, which is, you know, really the elected official's job is to deliver for their community. So they have to get something. So I, I get that. Um, but if you did have sort of a more as of right framework, even something like an Article 11 tax abatement, which is a tax abatement for affordable housing. That is a discretionary action by the city council. Like, why? You know, <laughs> that should be as of right. Everybody should want that, and mm -hmm. that should not be up for debate. And I think if you um, had more sort of a, a, a more defined framework, a more defined land use framework and, and community benefits type framework, you might be able to do stuff in a less hand-to-hand -hand way. Yeah. I mean, I will say that um, New Rochelle, I think, is a great example outside of the city. Um, and not just because my husband grew up there. Uh, but <laughs> the, we tried to work in New Rochelle probably 15 years ago, and it was such um, a city of nimbyism, of, of low rise, of home ownership, of fear of density, of... And it was just you know roadblock after roadblock after roadblock, and and time is the enemy when it comes to development. It really is. And at some point, and I will credit you know Luis Aragon, formerly of HPD, um, uh, sort of getting the city council to understand that they needed to sort of move out of their way, their own way, give themselves political cover of not having to vote yay or nay on any individual project, and do more stuff as a right. And today, New Rochelle is the downtown is burgeoning. You know, restaurants are are coming back. The buildings are mixed income. Um, you know, there's it's it's a middle class city. But you know, as a small city, to take such a bold step, it almost seems like it, we, we we as a big city <laughs> would would find it six times as hard to do because of all of our politics. So um, let me just remind folks we're going to turn to audience questions in in a few minutes. So. If you have, you've got a little card here, write your question, questions, not not speeches, questions, right? <laughs> um, um, uh, we'll be collecting those and, and asking them in a minute. But let, let me turn to, um, because we are moving really to the question of, of the kinds of proposals that are on the table right now, especially um, with the city of Yes. And, and of course, one thing, and, and this goes back to something that, that Blondell said, you know, we're in a very transitional or a very changing uh, atmosphere. Of course, New York is a city of change, and, and that's one of the things that makes it um, so great. But, you know, uh, bed -Stuy planned for the Innovation Campus to build uh, offices in tech and other things to, um, to help address the racial wealth gap. And then, of course, we had this thing called the pandemic, and... and <laughs> <laughs> changed office demand and changed all kinds of things. And so so one of the issues about a plan is it's got to be flexible because mm -hmm. you, you, you can't even plan for 10 years no, uh, no, when you have things no. like pandemics that come in between. So um, so that you know that's something that we, we've got to deal with and make sure that um, that we are building frameworks like more as of right um, across the board on certain kinds of things. So so how do you then think about, um, the city of yes proposals, and of course we haven't seen the text, we haven't seen specifics, but we have seen um, uh, a lot of great work out of, of city planning and a lot of good thinking um, and, and sort of high level things. So how do you think that, that that's going to hold up under supply skepticism or under the kinds of, of uh, concerns that we've talked about? And what more would you like to see there? So, Borough President, let me start with you. Yeah, I think the mayor said in best case scenario, everyone does some. Everyone that is able to take advantage of the city of Yes does it. It's a hundred thousand units of housing. Uh, so, I'm grateful that there's a recognition that there's more to be done. Uh, but I just think, uh, just like you know, Williamsburg and East New York, like we need we need more. Um, so, I get concerned that we do this and then people walk away. Right, that they think that this is bold, this is new, this is big, now let's just walk away. Um, and I don't think it is. So I wanna give all the credit in the world to the mayor and the administration for this work, because it is important. Mm -hmm. 
but it is not all. Um, what the city council is doing is putting targets forward in every single community, but they're not binding. So a council member could say, hey, I should get 5,000 units, and they don't need to do anything about it. It's just saying that they should contribute. So it's these ideas um, that I don't think are bold enough. But what we're doing, culturally changing mindsets on, for example, cars uh, and parking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a uh, car culture is deeply embedded into the city of New York. And it's breaking when somebody like Eric Adams, who is you know, a car-centric community, car-centric person, is saying we have to think about people over vehicles. It starts the conversation, and now people in 10 years, they're going to think we were in saying that we were building any parking in any of these buildings, right? So we're, we're, we're breaking culture. So I see a good thing with the city of Yes, in that long term, it'll start the fruits of this work right now, um, or the benefits of it, will come in, in short order. So I think it's a culture-changing opportunity more than actually something tangible. Great. Lisa? I think if we're bold enough to relinquish some of the, I'll call it control, over some of the smaller acts and buy into a bigger vision and a bigger strategy that is informed by the neighborhoods, we would do ourselves um, a, a service to put our egos and our, our political as aspects aside and just say, okay, um, Bay Ridge needs more multifamily housing and that's what we're gonna do. And, you know, okay, I'm term limited, but I'm gonna vote for this because I think for the long term, of, of Bay Ridge, that's what's needed. Um, and it is a long game. New York always evolves. New York is, is you know, one thing that makes New York New York is that w we are never satisfied with the status quo. We, we are always growing and changing. And, you know, you can go back and read like old essays by E.B. White in Here is New York and see sort of the same themes of, of affordability and dark tenements and so on and so forth. So. Look, I'm hopeful about New York. I think there's more we can do, but I think if we have the ability to relinquish control over things that we agree should be done and not go to that hand, hand combat Michelle was, was referencing, we won't have another Essex crossing that was cleared in urban renewal and stayed vacant for 40 years because of politics. And I give the city a lot of credit for having sort of done the hard work of the community engagement and you know, getting um, finally a proposal through, um, you know, 40 years. We don't have 40 years. We, we can't grow. We can't innovate. We can't house the next generation of young people who want to come here and create. And the families who have raised generations here who can't, can no longer stay. We have to be, move fast. Mm -hmm. Rondo? Um, with the city of yes, I mean, I know I'm encouraged by the, the town center zoning mm -hmm. um, because that would allow two to four stories to be built, um, a residential unit to be built on top of uh, ground floor commercial space in, in a neighborhood and community like, like Bed-Stuy and Fulton Street, uh, which is uh, a major corridor um, and shopping district, but it's mostly single story taxpayers to be able to have that opportunity, I think will be beneficial. Um, and I look forward to that moving forward. Um, but at the end of the day, to Lisa's point, I mean, we, we just we need as of right development. We, we just need to be able to move, move to move forward without the handcuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll I'll just say I think it's a it's a good um, foundation to start from. Um, you know, as as the borough president said, I, the, I think the parking um, requirement reduction is very very significant. Um, I just think uh, we, you know, we, we, we have Ruth Ann here from the state. Um, I know she's very eager to have bold visions like this at the state, and we, we need that strong partnership. So um, I do want to, uh, before we turn it over to, to audience questions, um, to ask what more, and you know, the Furman Center does research and, mm -hmm. and data analysis, and so what more could um, could be done by the research community, the policy analysis community, to help move forward on on these fronts in terms of supply skepticism? So, so one thing, yeah. especially that I am concerned about is, for example, how do we convince black and brown communities, low income communities, that it, it can't? We don't have the money to do all 100% affordable. You know, that's just not not realistic. 
given the, and we'd have to change a lot about society in order to get there. We should be bolder mm -hmm. for sure, but that'd require you know, more change than what we're talking about today. So, so what can we do to, to for example, show the, the moving chain issue that, you know, yes, you're probably not going to move into that market rate building, but that market rate building, the person who moves there is going to empty out an apartment. They're, the person who moves into that is going to empty out an apartment. And, you know, one of the, the studies that Matt mentioned showed that, you know, by the time you reached basically the fourth round, the, they, they actually had information about the incomes of the households and found that 40% of the households moving in to that fourth round were people making below median income, right? right? And so there is an advantage even to, to you know, lower income families of that market rate housing. But that's very hard to communicate, very hard to, to you know, it's yeah. a kind of a wonky thing. Yeah. I like wonky things, but, yeah. you know, not everybody <laughs> does. Yeah. 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 Um, so, so what can folks like us do to, to help you all move that debate forward? Uh, you, could, you could take the medicine first. Right? White people do it first. Like, that's the problem. It's like we have to convince black and brown neighborhoods that this is a good thing, then you do it first. Mm -hmm. You do it. If it's so good, go do it. Uh, and it's just, it's just not. So I, I just think it, it just, you know, Riverdale will never have a rezoning. It just won't. And, they're, and, and like, that's not fair. They said that about Soho No Ho. No, Soho No Ho. No. Uh, we had to get an elected official that was leaving. The, the place, uh, or the city council threatening that they would use, like the amount of work to get Noho Soho. <laughs> but I guess what my point is, but I agree, Noho Soho is the exception, not the rule. <laughs> Gowanus was the exception, not the rule. But uh, during de Blasio's time, it was all black and brown neighborhoods. So if you think it's good, go give it to somebody in a white neighborhood. If it works there, then we'll take all of it. We'll do it all. <laughs> but but it happened, happened, happened there. It's an equity issue. It's an equity issue. I think because I have a hard time in Bushwick. I was doing a rezoning. It was a modest rezoning. It wasn't a maximum opportunity in Bushwick. But it was a modest rezoning because that's all I can get. Because they kept saying, why us? Why are you? Because we volunteered during the de Blasio administration to take it on. It wasn't one of the 10 districts or the 10 areas that he was going to do. We voluntarily took it on. And we did a modest rezoning. We presented it to the city, and the city said no, that they would not do it. And it just like further solidified their concerns. And it's just like a modest rezoning is not good here, but no rezoning is perfectly fine in South Brooklyn, where there's no housing happening in white districts. Mm -hmm. And it's just like if we can do better and show people that we have equity in the work that we're doing, that everyone is going to build housing, that everyone is going to you know, go through. If gentrification is not real, then it'll be fine in these neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods that have higher income. So I would just say, help us by stop building. And, and the city told me this, Dan Gorodnik, we had a conversation. I was like, Dan, I need some more affluent districts to do some rezonings. He's like, we're on our way. We got it. But before we get there, I have these three districts that I want to look, show to you. They're all black and brown districts. Right. And it's just like, we got to stop. So I would say, you want to help me pitch this? Um, show me some white districts that have taken this on and have been successful. That would really help me make the pitch to, to the poor black and brown neighbors. Which, of course, more as of right zoning would do exactly that, right? As long as we could <laughs> yeah, yeah, agree, lift the agree. FAR cap, we need uh, to do agree, that still. So, um, Lisa? Yeah, I think um, one thing that I find troubling is, and you and I have talked about this a lot, is sort of the, the, the voiceless are the people who don't have the apartments yet. The people mm -hmm. who have the voices are the people who are already here. I got mine. You, you mm -hmm. stay out. You stay out. Mm -hmm. So I think sort of finding a way to sort of en en engage that, and I think, you know, the, the loss of community preference, if we, if we lose that lawsuit, is going to be bad. I understand that, you know, 80, 20, which is not even happening now, um, you know, I understand that why that's the poster child for not wanting to keep people out. But in most of the neighborhoods in the city, it's neighborhood people that benefit from neighborhood preference who want to stay in their often black and brown communities. And I think, you know, also making... It's a hard narrative to sell, and I don't really have a great way to sell this, but mixed income housing is good. Yeah, I agree. It's good economically to, to not have, you know, 
my building's a, a low-rise old building that nobody invests in because our rents are low, but he's living in a beautiful, shiny thing with a gym and a doggy spa. Um, <laughs> so I think trying to get that through, I think mixed income does work. We're seeing some of that actually in New Rochelle, and, which it's new to New Rochelle, and I think it's it's good. I mean, obviously that requires a tax abatement, but sort of... I think loss of community preference when we still have these, you know, individual conversations is not going to make anybody support anything more. So. Londell? Um, I think they've said it all. I think Antonio said it. Um, I don't even think I have to. <laughs> There's nothing to add. I mean, again. Um, you cede you know, your, you you your time to the gentlewoman. I cede my time. <laughs> I cede my time. <laughs> Um, I mean, in, in terms of what research I think could happen, I, I think, um, you know, a, additional research that's very, very specific to New York City, mm -hmm. um, I think would be very, very helpful. I think um, looking at the impacts of all the factors that, that were reviewed, but um, more specifically across income bands, I think would be very, very helpful because different, I think different communities and income bands experience things differently. Mm -hmm. I think part of the part that's hard to sell is, well, you're only going to get a 3% increase in rent instead of a 7% increase in rent. People are just like, it's still an increase. Right. Um, so, I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about that. Um, I, think, I think part of what we need to also acknowledge is that um, there's gentrification, there's displacement, but there's also cultural displacement. Um, and I think that... Um, we need to talk about that. We need to um, make room um, for acknowledging, uh, you know, ha having space so that uh, long-term folks, um, whether it's Latino, whether it's African American, whether it's Asian, like that, that there's institutions and uh, that um, continue to serve those communities in very, very meaningful ways, so that people don't feel as though they are displaced from their own home in, in, as newcomers come in. Um, and then I think. In general, I, you know, one of the things that I know I do a lot of educating around is like how things have changed. It's like, okay, we have the 2019 rent laws. We have, um, you know, we have a tenant right to counsel. Um, we have, a, you know, certificate of no harassment. Like kind of helping people understand what are the tools that exist and what are the tools that m are still missing that can help both renters and homeowners, right? And I think, you know, we have the deed theft bill. Um, that was just signed. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> that's that's huge. Like we need more of that. We help people understand how things have changed and what protections exist, and how to make sure that we are enforcing those protections um, and connecting people to resources. Great. So let me turn to um, a couple of things that from our audience. And if you you have a card, um, just hold it up. Um, so a couple of people ask a question. Uh, ask basically the same uh, question, which is. How do you strike the balance between ULER, which isn't as of right, which gives an opportunity for community engagement, mm -hmm. um, and other development approvals um, between between ULERP and those kinds of, of non as of right uh, approvals, and pushing developers for bold commitments to affordability um, and to being more aggressive, such that calls for unachievable levels of affordability are sort of co-opted uh, by NIMBYs uh, to the detriment of supply and ultimately affordability. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm going to broaden the question a little bit. That it's not just can NIMBYs co-opt the, the affordability question, but NIMBYs also can co-opt the kind of uh, goals that are required by um, the, the Fair mm -hmm. Housing Framework, those kinds of mm -hmm. things. So how do we, you know, how do we balance the need for more as of right versus more need for community engagement versus community engagement often being taken over by NIMBYs. Yeah. Any ideas on that? I would say you have to raise the floor. So one of the things that MIH did was, it, you know, to establish the floor that 25 percent, you know, 20 to 30 depending on which option, but most often it's option one, um, you know, 25 percent is, is affordable and permanently affordable. So I think there are more things like that. Um, and of course, you know, there's a call to revisit the AMI levels in, in MIH. Um, I, I think that helps a lot, actually, um, and establishes like the common, like no matter who, which, de you know, which neighborhood or which development, everyone has to abide by these things. I, I would agree with you, Michelle, but I think you have to take the, the second piece out of that because now it's the floor. It's mm -hmm. what was supposed to be a uniform 
public policy, and we can argue whether it should be tweaked or updated every so often becomes the floor. Well, that's not good enough for my neighborhood, uh, or I want option this or option that. So I think if you're creating that framework, you should take some of the, if, if you do the work up front to agree on the framework, it shouldn't be subject to my whims of that it's not good enough for me. So I think like it's sort of more upfront work, but, but a, a lack of ability to sort of renegotiate, renegotiate <laughs> along the way. Because you are when you do a ULERP, you're renegotiated by your council person, you're renegotiated by your community board, you're often renegotiated by your borough president unless you fulfill his, his points of agreement, and then you go back to your council member. So yeah. by the time you come out, you know, you, it's, you, you've been renegotiated a lot. So that basically <laughs> makes people go, okay, well, I know I'm going to have to renegotiate. So let me come in with something so big and outrageous that I know it's not something I want to build so I can come out with something. And that's not a good way to be. It's, it's better to sort of agree on the principles of this neighborhood is a 10 to 12 story, you know, mid-rise neighborhood or that neighborhood is, is transit oriented and could take more density, but take the individual negotiation out of it. I think one thing that would help, honestly, is like we, keep, we have to like um, do, share math <laughs> with people. Yes. And a lot of this is just math and what can be done based on what's available, um, whether it's tax breaks or right. the cost of construction. So, I, I, I mean, I think it goes back to the point, you know, the, these conversations are not siloed. Mm -mm. Right. Um, so it's not just about housing. It's about housing. It's about income, in, income inequality. Mm -hmm. Um, racial wealth gap, I think all health those things, health yeah. disparities, all those things factor into yeah. these decisions. And each neighborhood has their own concerns, um, to, to Lisa's point. So it's hard because mm -hmm. what, be, what becomes an income discussion in one neighborhood doesn't exist in another. Mm -hmm. So to have a floor, to your point, it's, it's, it's a difficult discussion to have, but it means, it's, again, a lot of legwork has, has to happen on the ground mm -hmm. to understand what, what's, what's going to be the touch point for this particular community, this neighborhood, when we talk about housing and we talk, we talk about income levels and when we talk about um, what's needed for the future. So I do yeah. think that that's really what we're all kind of dealing with on our, on our own respective levels. Which brings me to another one of the audience questions is one significant barrier to equitable distribution of new development is historic districts. Yeah. Do you mm -hmm. see a path for addressing that? And, and <laughs> Borough President, you mentioned yeah. that, but yeah. also it comes up in the question of cultural displacement, right? Mm -hmm. Historic buildings are really important cultural touch points um, for communities. And so how do we both, and also, let's be frank, we haven't done a good enough job across the city of, we, we protect lots of white cultural icons and we don't protect a lot of black and brown uh, cultural icons. So we need to adjust in that way. How do we do all that and move yeah. some of that out of the way? So, uh, any ideas there? <laughs> That's how the borough president answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> I think we'd all agree on that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is there any disagreement on that? But I, but I think but if how? you used a more finely grained approach, you know, maybe maybe you don't want to build a, a ten story building in, in Park Slope, but maybe you, you do have room for an ADU, either on top or on the bottom or wherever. Um, you know, and I think sort of more is more and an ADU isn't gonna move the needle of, of need, but Historic districts, I guess we would, I would pose the question to the historic districts as well. Okay, what is your fair share? How do you want to achieve it? And if, if you need to do X, what's the plan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm, um, I, I was going to say, um, I'm sorry, at I'm Best I, I'm, I'm literally mm -hmm. <laughs> sitting on a cultural center. Like in a historic in a, district, in, right? in a historic district. And that is... Um, that was one of the things that when we had the visioning um, sessions that every individual said that they want to ensure that the cultural nature of restoration of Bed-Stuy, the Billy Holiday Theater, that it is front and center. Mm -hmm. So whatever we're doing, whatever you're building, that cultural piece has to remain and we want to see it. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to see it hidden behind any buildings. We want to see it in the center of this this. You know, this plaza of this innovation campus. Um, and it's math. <laughs> it's math because yeah. it's, it's building it. Um, it's maintaining it from a sustainability standpoint. And, you know, um, cultural organizations of color don't get the same level of investment yeah. on philanthropy. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a discussion, a bold discussion that has to be happening right now in order to sustain the cultural integrity within our community. 
So that's something else Furman could do on the math, is show the math. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, I think we're, okay. people, when we say it, people are understandably skeptical. Oh, you're an evil developer. Of course you're going to say math. But, <laughs> which I get, but the math is the same. Math and is math. What, what Michelle builds is the same math, and what Blundell builds when she does housing is the same math as my math. The math is the math. Is the math. So I think part of it's the messenger. So maybe you all could play a role in being the messenger. Well, amazingly, affordable housing is even more expensive to build. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Subject of another breakfast. Yes. Um, <laughs> let, let, me, let me just wrap up by saying, and, and I know that there are, are many people here um, from the state who have worked very hard to move things forward. And thank you, Ruth Ann, for all you've done, and Kate Van Tassel, all, all she's done, and, and many others. But, but we do need the state. So knowing that the state is so important, um, how do we shift the state politics to allow New York to do what New York needs to do, New York City needs to do to be bold? How do we move that needle? I mean, I, I think at the very least it has to be treated like a campaign and you have to have clear targets and you have to have a strategy. Um, I mean, obviously there has to be a clear vision, but I mean, there's so many allies that I think that could be engaged. Um, I mean, you know, Fifth Avenue Committee is part of Neighbor Works America. There are 16 Neighbor Works America organizations across New York State that I think would be very, very eager to be uh, engaged. Obviously, there's, you know, um, neighborhood preservation corporations across the state. I, I think, like, let's have the ground game, basically. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a political battle that the governor lost, unfortunately. Uh, it's politics, and they played it poorly. We could have had a lot of changes at the state level right now should we have played our politics better? And we didn't. Uh, and it's, a, it's an unfortunate thing. It was a huge loss. And there's no, it's objectively, it was a huge loss for the city of New York to not be able to come to an understanding on the housing work in the state level. And I just hope that the governor this time around um, doesn't leverage or negotiate outside of the, the most pressing issue even more pressing than the migrant crisis is a housing crisis because that is a crisis in itself because there's no housing supply. So housing has to be the number one thing. We can't talk about nonsense like bail reform and, and, and use that as like a, a B-level item that we want to negotiate. No, stop it. It's housing. It is a crisis and everyone needs to get on board and that should be negotiated from the, the strongest level of power and influence and politics that she could possibly exert. And that's what it is. It is political will. So I expect it to happen next time because I think she didn't fare well politically the last time over this issue. And, you know, folks harden. And I guarantee, or I hope, and I'm going to be a part. I'm going to stand right next to her, letting pe people know. Uh, no, n no is not acceptable. This has to happen um, this time around. So it's just a political thing. And I think she's ready. I'm excited for it. Um, and I think you guys can help. Everyone can help by just showing that there's more of us than there is of other folks that are saying no to it. Don't you think it's analogous to sort of the conversation we were having earlier about every neighborhood? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, whereas um, maybe Scarsdale is Riverdale in this, <laughs> in your analogy. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, so getting, it, it's, this, it's the same sort of forces of I want to preserve my mm -hmm. historic brownstone and park slope or my, you know, single family acre zoning in Chappaqua, whatever. And I think it's, I think it's the, the politicians being bold enough to, to sort of take on that fight. And yeah, but it's you hard. Could, yeah, but she comes from a position of strength. It's the stuff that, elected, that mayors and governors have done throughout their entire time. You won't pass any legislation for the next five years while I'm the governor if you don't support this. You, this these things are important to you. The, the state of New York is in crisis. The city of New York is in crisis. I would not allow for your self-interest and your localization to be what determines on whether or not we can solve for a crisis. And housing is a human right. We, we say that all the time. We march on these issues. And we cannot allow you to, to, to deter our, our ability to provide housing to the people of New York. And if you're doing that just politically, take it out on them. Jay Jacobs spends a ton of money trying to take out Democrats against Republicans, and he's like the head of the Democratic Party. Why not use those resources to put threaten people that are not supporting housing development in their districts to show that we will not only use our legislative authority, we will use our political authority to make sure you do this. It's always happened. It always has happened, and that's how people move. And I think that that's the type of power, um, and uh, I guess it, it can't be, well, I would love to negotiate with you. 
No, there's no negotiation. Mm -hmm. It's done. You're going to be a part of this. And if you're not, you will suffer repercussions for it. Right. But we need the Senate and the Assembly to sort of bring their members along with yeah. that. Thre That's an Throwing them all. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing them all. Off all of them. So I'm all gonna I'm gonna wrap that all up by saying <laughs> by saying, look. We have a lot of evidence about the importance of housing and the way that new supply can help us move ourselves out of this crisis. It's a crisis. We need to be bold. Uh, let's go. Yeah. How's that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you.